Welcome back to The Art of Value, and today it's part two of Boom and Bust, A Global History of Financial Bubbles. So this is a book I read recently, a really good book about financial bubbles. I'm a bit of a student of, of financial bubbles throughout history. I've read a few books on it, and this one was from 2021, really good, written by William Quinn and John D. Turner. So part one, go and find part one to explain because we're, we're kind of uh, deep in it here. Uh, part two, look at this. We're going to talk about the bubble triangle. So yesterday, or the last time I explained about how uh, they've come up with this framework for analyzing bubbles or recognizing bubbles and maybe what to how to recognize them in the future. So we've got this, this triangle with uh, speculation, marketability, and money and credit, which are equivalent to oxygen, heat, and fuel like a fire, and the spark that that uh, ignites the bubble can be politics or technology. And let me just find where I was up to here. Okay, so let me explain just to recap quickly. We propose that an, an analogous structure can be used to describe how bubbles are formed, the bubble triangle. Bubble selection criteria which bubbles to investigate. So they investigated a number of bubbles, which as I explained last time throughout history, including the subprime crisis and the dot-com bubble and so on. But their selection criteria, that they only have two. There are, there are different ones, of course, and it's debatable what a, what a bubble is. Uh, but they use where there was a large rise and then a fall in asset prices. Okay, that's pretty basic. And they required a 100% rise over less than three years, followed by at least a 50% collapse of prices over a three-year period or less. So we can think back um, in history and also recently, I'm thinking, I've been thinking as I was reading this book about, I think there was a, like a, an innovation type stock bubble in the US where during the pandemic, maybe it would be called the COVID bubble, I don't know. Where, where a lot of uh, tech stocks, emerging tech stocks, innovation stocks, other stocks, other some other ones too, e, the EV stocks in particular as well, rocketed four five hundred percent in less than a year, and then the following year in twenty twenty one from about February started to decline, and some of them are down fifty to ninety percent. So I think that would qualify under, under that criteria. And their second criteria though. Oh, wait, first, they talk about for, st for stock market bubbles, we do not require the whole market to have experienced a reversal. It may have taken place in specific sectors or industries. This means that bubbles, this means the bubbles were major ones. The ones that they looked at were they're making sure that they're major bubbles. So in the second criterion, the asset price reversal must have been accompanied by a promotional boom with new companies or financial securities being floated on, on financial markets. This ensures the bubble had an impact on the economy beyond the effect of the price reversal. This excludes bubbles in commodities and collectibles. Real estate and property bubbles were excluded unless they were accompanied by bubble bubbles in stocks or facilitated by the issuance of newly created financial securities. So obviously they looked at the subprime bubble because that involved mortgage-backed securities and they were so they were tradable and that ignited the bubble, that helped ignite the bubble with a possibility. So it was a, a combination of those two. So they did include that and it affected society in a major way, the whole global economy in fact. So this is the bubble triangle to recap. So heat, oxygen, fuel is needed for the fire and for a bubble we need speculation, marketability and uh, easy money and credit. And they talked about technology can can spark the bubble or political uh, political policy, a new political policy or a new, you know, new poli politics can. So, okay, so let's, I, today I wanted to talk about these these three, these three in partic particular, which they go into marketability, speculation, and money and credit. I'll try and get through to the end. I don't want this to be any more than 15 minutes or so. 
So the first side of the bubble triangle, the oxygen for the boom is marketability, the ease with which an asset can be bought and sold. So I think what we want to think about in the last couple of years, like in 2020, 20, what happened? Was there anything that involved uh, marketability, things were uh, stock, certain stocks in particular, there were a lot of IPOs uh, as stocks took off in 2020 and there was a lot of money. Well, that's and money's next. So bubbles are often preceded by the legislation of certain types of financial assets. Another factor is divisibility. If it's possible to buy only a small proportion of the asset, that makes it more marketable. So new financial assets or certain types of financial assets legislation. So in 2020, there are a lot of SPACs that uh, what SPACs weren't new, but they certainly became popular and very marketable. Bubbles sometimes follow financial innovations such as mortgage-backed mortgage -backed securities uh, that make that made previous indivisible assets, in this case, mortgage loans, divisible. Another dimension of marketability is the ease of finding a buyer or seller. One of the least marketable investments assets is art, for example, because the pool of potential buyers is small in comparison to assets like gold and government bonds. So what, an interesting thing that I, that I thought about when I was reading it is NFTs, the rise of NFTs lately. So that's brought a whole new lot of buyers, different buyers, a, a wider pool of all of buyers and potentially over time a lot more than the traditional art market uh, which is really quite small uh, and so it's made it digital and divisible and tradable on a daily basis bubbles are often characterized by increased participation in the market for the bubble asset expanding the potential pool of buyers and sellers by the way i'm not saying that there's a bubble in, in, in nfts although <laughs> You, you could make that argument. I haven't really looked into it, but some of the, it hasn't crashed yet. It's, it's become less popular, but, uh, and it's not really a huge, it's, there aren't actually a huge number of people involved in that as, as far as I understand. It's thousands rather than millions so far. Bubbles are often characterized by increased participation in the market for bubble asset. Okay, I said that, expanding the potential pool of buyers and sellers. And so I think in 2020, we had, you know, the phenomenon, phenomenon of Robin Hood, where trading became free, pretty much free, although it was, the, you know, the trading, trading costs were built in, but uh, we could say, you know, transaction costs uh, are as good as free or built in. People didn't know that, that, that it was built in often. And that created a whole lot of new retail buyers, a new generation, and they got stimulus from the government as well. So, you know, that all that all helped lead to that bubble, I think, in the in the favorite retail stocks. Finally, it matters how the asset can be transported. Assets that can be transferred digital, digitally can now be bought and sold multiple times a day. Okay, so again, digital uh digital gold we can think of crypto I'm not saying all these are bubbles but they've got they you know have the potential to uh, Bitcoin went through a bubble in 20 late 2017 and it's gone back up again it's sort of a bubble bubble and bust boom and bust there for sure like oxygen marketability is always present to some extent and is essential for an economy to function however just as one would not keep oxygen tanks beside an open fire there are times and places in which too much marketability can be dangerous. And we can all think back to bubbles. I don't know if you are old, you if you're older, you might remember the dot-com bubble and how all this played out back then. Okay, so the fuel for the bubble, if you look at the triangle, the fuel is the money or credit. A bubble can form only when the public has sufficient capital to invest in the asset and therefore is much more likely to occur when there is abundant money and credit in the economy. Low interest rates and loose credit conditions stimulate the growth of bubbles in two ways. So let's think about that. Low interest rates and loose credit, which has happened in the last few years. I mean, interest rates are practically zero. And um, so people could borrow money cheaply and we had stimulus and uh, quantitative easing as well, a lot of new money printed, all these these are conditions 
that they have said implied. I mean, this book was written before before this, but uh, in fact, I think this, it seems to be the writing was was pre twenty nineteen even. So they haven't written about what's happened in the last two years, but you know it does fit with what's been going on. First, the bubble assets themselves may be purchased and with borrowed money, driving up their prices. So there's been a lot of margin lending in the last few years, even by retail investors. Robinhood allows it easy. There's been controversies uh, to, to, to do with that, where people, it's easy lend, easy margin borrowing. So they give out money easily. And even one, there was one, one uh, case where somebody uh, committed suicide based on the fact that they they thought they owed you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think it was 700, but really it w wasn't quite the case th through Robin Hood and there was a court case about that. Uh, second, low interest rates on traditionally safe assets such as, such as government debt or bank deposits can push investors to reach for yield by investing in risky assets instead. As a result, Funds flow into risky assets, where in a bubble is much more likely to where a bubble is much more likely to occur, to occur. The propensity of investors to reach for yield has a long history. So they go through bubbles throughout history where it's been very similar, and I would argue that that have that's that happened in 2020 as well, with uh, certain certain sectors. I'm not talking about the whole market, but definitely certain sectors where. There's a lot of margin and money flowed. It, it seemed like easy money when stocks were going up hundreds of percent. And there was, you know, the memes, uh, stonks, stonks only go up, all of the stuff. People were new investors and they had, and then of course it crashed. It did start to crash in 2021. So the third side of the, bu of the bubble triangle analogous to heat is speculation. Speculation is the purchase or sale of an asset with a view to selling or repurchasing the asset at a later date with the sole motivation of generating capital gain. Speculation is always present to an extent. However, during bubbles, large numbers of novices become speculators. Again, think about the last couple of years, many of whom trade purely on momentum, buying when stocks are rising and selling when prices are falling, just as a fire process, its own heat. Once it starts, a speculative investment is self-perpetuating. That doesn't make sense, but you get, <laughs> you get the idea. I must have taken notes wrong there. Um, so once it starts, it's self-perpetuating a fire, and it's the same as long as it's got the fuel. So again, if we think about the last, you know, especially in 2020, uh, there were, you know, and as well during the dot-com bubble, the during the 90s, there were a lot of day traders and in the late 1990s, uh, the price of transactions went down, but it wasn't like it is now where it's free or very low. Uh, and there were a lot of people day trading then too. And um, recently, you know, in, the, in, in that time in 2020, there were and there's a new generation of day traders who who were trading off volatile stocks and stocks that were going up, pit, you know, quite a few percent every day to hundreds of percent. So. Early speculators make large profits, attracting more speculative money, which in turn results in further price increases and further run returns to speculators. The amount, the amount of speculation required to, to start the process is only a small fraction of what occurs at the peak. So again, another, uh, another area is meme stocks, right? People were it was purposefully driving it up. It's a little bit different because there was an activa uh, activist intent there. And I constantly, well not constantly, but sometimes talk to people online who are the apes there, who are, you know, they're waiting for the uh, mother of all short squeezes. It's these like GameStop and, uh, and AMC have gone gone down like 70% since then, but still hopeful of, of it going, of, of uh, making a huge gain from that and holding diamond hands, but and it may do that. It may go up again. We just don't know. But it's definitely a bubble. But people see that differently. As it wasn't spec, there wasn't speculation involved there. But I, I think there definitely was. There are a lot of people in there who are just in it for the quick money, 
And, you know, they said, well, what, you know, institutions are making money, why can't the retail investor, what, you know, sort of democ democratizing. Once a bubble is underway, professional speculators may purchase an asset they know to be overpriced, planning to resell the asset to a greater pool to make capital gain. The practice is commonly referred to as riding the bubble. However, it is often often difficult to distinguish between investors who rode the bubble and those who are lucky enough to sell at the right time. So the book um, gives two different stories that are that are not recent. Some one's old, uh, one's old and one's not. I'm going to keep going. We're up to 15 minutes. I'm just going to keep going because we're not too far away from the end. So two stories. By the time he was 30 years old, Handel, classical musician, uh, composer. Uh, his musical compositions had already made him a very wealthy man and his, his patron queen and provided him with a considerable income. In, in 1715, he invested some of his wealth in five shares of the South Sea Company, which was a slave trading com company, shockingly, today, which would have cost about £440 sterling. Handel sold his shares before the end of 1719, which is four years later, for a profit of about £145, just before the huge bubble and the company shares began. So he got out early through luck or, you know, being wise about it. So these are these are two artists, by the way, which is interesting too. The art of value investing, the art of value. So the other one is Shane Filan, who was a uh, lead singer in Westlife. It wasn't particularly ba band or group that I like the music of, but but he was known that he, the book talks about how they made, I think it was about 30 million euro, was it? Would have been 30 million pounds, I don't know. That they, uh, and he became a property developer, I guess he was Irish, so. So he became a property developer after making lots of money, he and his brother, I think, in the Irish property bubble and became bankrupt, owing 18 million pounds by the, by the time the, the bubble burst. It's one of those things where you couldn't, couldn't lose so that was part of the global financial crisis originating in the US of course so two artists one one worked out well by selling early before the bubble but still making money and another one who was made bankrupt should we um, compare Westlife to Handel though <laughs> let's not talk about their their art uh, just their, their finances Investors can also speculate for the fall by short selling to the bubble. Okay, that's a lot harder. And uh, Michael Burry was doing that with Tesla and uh, Arc Innovation and uh, on, on Twitter was saying that. So he might have missed. It's hard, it's hard to time, even with somebody as expert as him who got the um, subprime bubble right. Maybe he did. Maybe he went back in. We don't know yet. We'll have to see. But it's been going down for a year. Or not. Not Tesla, but uh, ARK stocks have been going down for for over a year. What is the spark that sets the bubble ablaze? So we have technology, innovation, or government policy. So the fuel tech innovation sparks the bubble by generating abnormal profits at firms that use the new technology, leading to large capital gains. And uh, at this stage, many new companies that use or purport to use the new tech get involved. While valuations seem unreasonably high to experienced observers, the, they often persist for two reasons. First, the new tech is has an impact on, the, the new tech It's highly uncertain. I'm talking, thinking about the innovation stocks here. This means there's limited information to value and the shares accurately, because they're often early stage and we don't know what uh, the impact technology is gonna have yet seven in the dot-com bubble as well second excitement surrounding the tech leads to high levels of media attention drawing in further investors so crypto and innovation stocks at the ev sector so there's often a, accompanied by the emergence of a new era narrative in which the world changing technology of the new tech renders old valuation metrics obsolete so the seven in 2020 as well as the dot-com bubble justifying the high prices Alternatively, a bubble can be sparked by government policies that cause asset prices to rise. So I won't go too much into that, but we all know what happened in the subprime bubble and you know new new sorts of securities. So crypto is outside government policy, but uh, we'll have to see what happens there. Um, 
So it often bubbles a spark by governments on purpose and might be part of an attempt to reshape society in a way that the government deems desirable. Some housing bubbles have been sparked, for example, by the desire of governments to increase the level of home ownership. Okay, so tech, tech and politics can be the spark of two bubbles or can be the lay the groundwork for bubbles. Why do bubbles end? One obvious reason is that they run out of fuel. There's a finite amount of money and credit to be invested and increases the market interest rate uh, of central bank tightening, which is happening at the moment in the US, can cause the amount of credit to fall. So in the US at the moment, it's interesting that as soon as the Fed decided well, they need to put interest rates up because of inflation, oh, we were wrong about inflation, it's not transitory, interest rates go up and a lot of tech stocks go down. And uh, alternatively, the tightening of credit markets can make it impossible for those who invested in the bubble with borrowed money to extend the duration of their loans, forcing them to sell the asset, which I do think has been happening as well. The number of speculators is also finite, so it can eventually reach an upper limit. We just run out of bias. Speculators can be spooked in the index of the market when new information ar arrives, which changes their expectations about prices. So new announcements, uh, speculators are typically buy an asset because their price is rising. Even a slight reversal can dramatically reduce the assets appeal. So, you know, if you think about the EV sector, that hasn't happened really, or it has happened to a certain extent, but it's been just a huge excitement on the technology. And, uh, but some like Rivian is, uh, Rivian was one of the most amazing we've ever seen. We went up to over a hundred billion in market cap and they have only it's sold, sold zero cars at that point, I think, or like not very many. So it's all on the future expectation. Why do some bubbles cause widespread damage and the others have little effect? Two variables, the size of the bubble and its centrality in the wider economy. So the dot-com bubble didn't really have, it caused, there was a recession afterwards, but it didn't cause huge widespread damage like the subprime bubble did globally because uh, it wasn't so embedded in the, in the rest of the economy. It is thought. Uh, the com a common route to there we go. A common route for the damage to spread is by the banking system, which you know subprime was embedded. So just in summary, this is it. Um, our bubble triangle describes the necessary conditions for a bubble: marketability, market and cr money and credit, and speculation. Those three things together, they become sufficient conditions for a bubble only when the addition of the suitable tech or political spark. So that's really something to think about going forward and what's happened in the last few years. And then I do recommend reading the book. It's really, really good. It goes back uh, through bubbles over history and some of the really significant ones. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. I enjoyed, really enjoyed reading the book and uh, making notes on it and presenting it. See you next time.